and thanks for tuning in to the Oxygen Alliance YouTube channel where we share the concentrated talk virtual meeting hosted every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. In the talk, we discuss different aspects of oxygen concentrate assessment, use, and maintenance. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications bell. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Concentrator Talk Call brought to you by the Oxygen Alliance. My name is Naomi Thompson, and I'm pleased to be your host today. Joining me are my colleagues, Maui Lungu and Aubrey Jimkunda and Wayne Longa Malawi. Today we'll be joined by our usual technicians from Obino 2 and Sunrise. And on the technicians panel today we have Paulina Mohosho, Masofo Mujaji, Kowinda Singh, Kelvin Saidi, Fatsani Damandikani, Dominic Mapanje, Eunice Msistia and Sharon Ngozo. In case you're just joining us for the first time, the Considerator Talk Call is a virtual meeting hosted by the Oxygen Alliance every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. And here we discuss various aspects of oxygen concentrators, maintenance, their use and assessment. So in case you have any questions regarding um, your oxygen concentrators, you can send us your questions through our email, info at oxygenalliance.org and our technicians will do the very best to help you with the best solutions. In case you have any questions during the call, you can simply raise up your hand and you come off mute and ask your question or you can simply paste it in the chat and I'll read it out and our technicians will help you with the required solutions. If you have any questions during the call, you can simply raise up your hand and come off mute and ask your question or you can simply paste them in the chat and I'll read them out and our technicians will do their very best to respond to those questions. As usual, we normally have a topic of interest and today Fatsani Tamandikani will be taking us through the types of oxygen concentrators. So make sure we're together to the end of the call. Without further ado, we jump into our questions. So our first question reads, Hello, I'm a technician at Kasungu District Hospital and I was conducting BPM on a J5 oxygen concentrator. I noticed that when I switch the concentrator on while it is plugged out of the socket, the power failure alarm does not sound. During the concentrator talk call of 2nd February 2023, it was discussed that alarms are a way of communicating with the machine. My question is, how does this alarm work and how can I get the alarm to function properly again? So I'll ask one of our technicians on the panel to respond to that question. Okay, I see a hand from Kelvin Saidi. So Kelvin Saidi, respond to that question. Thank you very much, Naomi. And thank you for the question. So the J5 concentrators power failure alarm system is managed by a circuit that is powered by a 3.6 volt battery, as shown in the graphics. Yeah. So the circuit consists of a buzzer, an LED, a PNP transistor, and a battery. And the negative terminal of the battery and a GPIO pin on the circuit board microcontroller are both connected to the base of the PNP transistor. So the way this works is that when the switch is turned on while there's no power, uh, meaning that the unit is not plugged in, uh, it completes the circuit and uh, the buzzer sounds. But when power is available, the GPIO pin supplies a voltage to the transistor base and this opens the circuit of the alarm and this silences the buzzer. So there are a few possible causes of the scenario you're facing. The first cause could be that the battery powering the alarm system is faulty. So in order to check this, uh, you need to put your multimeter on the voltage setting and check the value of the battery. If the voltage value is not within the range of the specified value, in our case, it is 3.6 volts, then the battery is dead and it needs to be replaced. Another cause would be that the wire harness that goes to the switch is broken. So the graphics point to the wire harness that goes to the switch. So if this wire is not continuous, you can check the continuity using a multimeter. And if it is not continuous, you need to replace it because this could be the 
<coughs> factor that is causing the alarm system not to sound. I hope that answers your question. Thank you and over to you now. Thank you very much, Kelvin Saidi, for that wonderful response. Do we have any follow-up questions or comments to what Kelvin has responded? Okay, seems like we have none. Um, so we will move on to our next question. Uh, well done to those that send us those questions because uh, now we know that you follow through with the considerator talk and that is amazing. Our second question reads, Hi, I'm a biomedical technician and I was working on a J5 oxygen concentrator where we were refilling seat beds and also checking the integrity of the valve block. After putting them back in place, I have noticed that the pressure has dropped, both the output and the pressure from the seat beds. I tried checking for leakages and I found none, but the pressure is still very low. I even tried adjusting um, the pressure regulator but then the pressure is still low. What can the problem be and how can I solve this? So I'll ask one of our technicians to respond to that question. The, we have a hand from Sharon Gozo. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the question. One of the reading causes of a drop in pressure is leakages. And since you have already checked for them and found none, the other thing you can check is if there are any blockages in the tubings. If there are any blockages in the system, the air will be obstructed and hence reducing the pressure at the outlet and also the secret. If you have checked for blockages and found none, then the other possible cause is that the valve broke has not been replaced in its right orientation in the system. So in your questions, you have mentioned that you are lifting seatbelts and checking the integrity of the valve block. Now, the valve block of the J5 oxygen concentrator makes use of the pneumatic air pipe connectors that connect the tubes, bringing in air and taking out air, including those pipes that are used for feeding and resting in the seatbelt. So these connectors have the ability to rotate and this rotation can end up confusing someone who is not very familiar with the orientation of the valve block. If the connectors happen to have made rotation when removing the valve block, one can simply connect the valve block the other way around. This will mean that the intake will now be connected with the pipe that goes to the that goes to one of the exhaust muffler, and the exhaust muffler will be connected to the intake tube. This will distort the operation of the valve block. So it should be noted that the part that freshes you when it is collected or installed is the side that has rings on it. And the back part that is supposed to be on the inside does not, as you can see on the graphics. So connect the valve block in its right orientation and you have your pressures back to normal and every time when you're trying to disassemble a concentrator that you're not familiar with make sure you try to mark the parts so that you shouldn't mess things up when putting everything back together so you can mark with a sharpie or a marker or you can take some photos or you can take some videos that you can use later as a guide when assembling things back together thank you Thank you very much, Sharon, for that wonderful response and uh, some tips that we can use when we are disassembling our machines. It is really important to take note of the orientation of the things, the parts that we're taking apart so that when we're putting them back, we don't have much trouble or we don't have cases where we have turned or uh, moved around with your orientation of the part. So thank you very much for that response. But also, I would just like to add that since you um, adjusted the pressure regulator, be sure to put it back to normal when you replace the valve block in its right position. So do we have any comments or questions from the panel or um, those that have joined? Okay, seems like we have none. Thank you for that response once again, Sharon. So we will move on to our next question. And our next question reads, hello, 
At our workshop, we have three oxygen concentrators that are in good shape, but the only problem is that they do not have power cables. Can I use a cable made for a laptop charger or a television screen on the concentrators? So this technician wants to know if they can use cables that are used for television screens or um, laptop charges on their concentrators. So I'll ask one of our technicians to respond to this question. If it is possible for them to use uh, those cables. Okay, we have a hand from Dominic. Uh, thank you, Naomi. So uh, it is not every power code power code which you can use on an oxygen concentrator. Wire gauge refers to the thickness of a wire and it is what determines the pebbles or the application of the cable. Each gauge is denoted by a number. Small gauge numbers signify thicker wires and large numbers signify uh, thinner wires. A Megan wire gauge is the standard method for measuring the thickness or cross-section area of electrically conducting wire. Thickness of a cable affects its electrical properties, which are the resistance and current carrying capacity. This is so because resistance increases with decreasing thickness, which in turn reduces the voltage. And also, thin wires tend to heat up faster, hence they are not ideal for applications that require high current. Therefore, before you can put the cables on the concentrator, check their American wire gauge ratings, which are usually marked on the cable and make sure you use the cable with the correct wire gauge. If you use a long and thin wire, the performance of the compressor will be affected due to increased resistance that causes a voltage drop. This in turn will affect the oxygen period of your concentrator. There are two types of cables, solid wire and round stranded wire. Stranded wires are mostly used in concentrators because they are more flexible than solid wires. So it is wrong to take the outer diameter of a cable insulation as the wire gauge of your cable as you are measuring the size or the diameter of your cable. For the stranded cable, you have to calculate the cross-section area of a strand inside the cable and then multiply the cross-section area of a single strand by the total number of strands inside that cable. Then using the number you have as a result, which is in squared millimeters, you can refer to the chart shown in the graphics to identify the American wire gauge number of your cable. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dominique, for that response. The thickness and the type of the cable that we're using can affect the purity of our oxygen. So thank you very much for that response. Uh, we have a poll at the end of the question, and I'll ask Maui Lung to launch the poll, and he's also going to explain how we can access the poll to those that are new and those that do not have an idea. Maui? Right. Uh, thank you very much, Naomi. Um, so I am launching our first poll, which reads, did you know that the thickness of your power cord can affect the performance of a concentrator? Did you know that the thickness of the power cord can affect the performance of a concentrator? So if you're joining us from your mobile phone, then if you go on the bottom right of your screen, there is a menus option, it's three dots. You click on that, the window opens up where uh, the activities button is one of the listed option. If you click on the activities button, it will open up another window where the pause menu is one of the listed options. So that's how you can access the pause from your mobile phone. If you're joining us from your computer, then just go on the, the icon on the far right of your screen, it's a uh, stacked uh, symbols, a triangle, a circle, and a square. If you click on that, it will open up a window, a side panel, and the pause menu is one of the listed options from there. All right, uh, the votes are still coming in. And uh, yeah, it seems uh, most of us knew uh, the effects, that the thickness of the wire can bring in. But then still, uh, we have some who uh, didn't know that the thickness of the wire can affect the performance. So yeah, now you know, and uh, hopefully that will uh, make you uh, change the wires if need be, uh, because there are other concentrators that uh, come with wires that are not of the right thickness, especially the, the kettle cables. So you might want to get the right wires. 
so I am going to end the poll now and I will hand it back to you, Naomi. Thank you very much, Maui, for that poll, but also thank you, Dominic, once again, for the rich spots. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, if you're new and you're just joining us for the first time, be sure to share with us your contact details in the chat so that we can be able to add you to the emailing list. And that will enable us to send you notifications of our next meetings and all the activities that we have going on in the Oxygen Alliance. But also, if you have any questions, you can simply raise up your hand and come off mute and ask your question or you can paste it in the chat and I'll read it out and our technicians will do their very best to help you with the right solutions. You can also send your questions through to our email info at optionalliance.org if in case you have any problems with your considerator to deal with assessment, use and maintenance. So remember to do that. Um, do we have any follow-up questions to what Dominic uh, just explained? Okay, so we will move on to our next question. And our next question reads, I am working on a DeVille Base 525 oxygen concentrator. When I plug it to the main socket, the reset switch on the concentrator trips and the concentrator does not turn on. How do I deal with such a problem? So when they plug in the concentrator, the reset switch is tripping. How can they deal with that problem? So I'll ask one of our technicians on the panel to respond to this question. Okay, we have a hand from Masofa. You go ahead. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, uh, most concentrators have the reset button on their front panel. Uh, reference on the picture. The main function of the reset button is to protect the electrical circuit from overload. Therefore, whenever any component inside the concentrator is drawing more electrical, uh, I mean, electrical current than it is supposed to, the reset button will trip, will trip automatically, will trip automatically and switch off the concentrator. In some circumstances, the reset button may trip due to poor main, main, main power or when the button itself is faulty. There, there are a number of things that you have to do in order to solve this problem. First, check the quality of the main power. If it is up to standard as given by your local electric, electric supplier, with a digital multimeter. Check all internal electrical uh, connections of the concentrator to make sure that you don't have any short circuits. Then check the compressors, the compressors electrical integrity. A simple check would be to replace the compressor with a working compressor and see if the reset switch trips trips or not. If all of the above seem to be okay, then check the PC, the, the PC port uh, electrical integrity by disconnecting the main the main power and removing the PC port from the concentrator. Then look but uh, then looking for any short circuit in the circuit in the PC port using a digital multimeter. If all of the above check out, then, then check the reset button electrical integrity by replacing it with a working reset switch and checking if the problem persists or not. Back to you, Naomi. Thank you very much, Masofa, for that wonderful response. Do we have any comments or questions? So we'll move on to our next question. Our next question reads, hello, I'm a biomedical technician working on an oxygen concentrator with a product tank that is heavily leaking. At our workshop, we do not have spare product tanks. Can I use the machine without a product tank by just connecting the output tubing to the seedbed to a pressure regulator? Can they use without, can they use the machine without um, a product tank? 
that is what they want to know. So I'll ask one of our technicians to respond to this question. We have a hand from Unisim Sister. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the question. So we need to know that an oxygen concentrator works by drawing in ambient air and purifying it of, ox of nitrogen so that what remains is concentrated oxygen. The purification of this air is done inside the seedbeds that contain a molecular sieve called zeolite. A product tank is one of the major components of an oxygen concentrator. It is connected between the seedbeds and the pressure regulator. Oxygen from each of the seedbeds is directed to the product tank and there are three reasons why that is the case. The first reason for using a product tank in an oxygen concentrator is that it acts as an intermediate tank for mixing oxygen. Each seedbed may produce oxygen of different purities. The product tank therefore allows the oxygen from both the seedbeds to mix up inside of it so that it is able to provide a steady oxygen purity to the patient. The other reason for using a product tank is to stabilize differences in pressures from the seedbeds. Just like oxygen purity, the seedbeds may also produce different pressures, which is then stabilized to a steady pressure inside the product tank. Some models of concentrators like the Devil B525 have a larger product tank to cater for a cut in oxygen flow when there has been a power cut. The Devolve is 525, for example, can provide oxygen to the patient for up to five minutes at maximum flow after a power cut, which is good as it provides ample time for the users to provide uh, or to find an alternative method like using oxygen cylinders. So from the explanation, we can see that the product tank is a very important part of an oxygen concentrator. An oxygen concentrator should not be used without a product tank. So depending on the location of the leak on the product tank, you can try out some solutions. If the leak is around the connection to the pressure regulator, you can put thread tape on the regulator before feeding it in. If the leak is on the joints of the product tank, you can use epoxy to seal the leaks. Otherwise, using a concentrator without a product tank should never be an option. Thank you very much. Back to you now. Thank you very much, Eunice, for that response, but also that emphasis. Do not use your oxygen concentrator without the product tank. That will affect your purity, that will affect your flow and the pressure as well. So let's try our best to use the solutions that Eunice has given us on how we can take care of the leaks. We can seal them up with thread tape or epoxy. So thank you very much for that response. Do we have any additional comments or questions uh, on what Eunice has explained. Okay, seems like we have none. So right now we are going to jump into our topic of interest and Hatsani Ramandikani will be taking us through the types of oxygen concentrators. Let's stay tuned. Hatsani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Naomi. So it's time for our today's topic of interest. And in today's topic of interest, we're going to look into types of oxygen concentrators that are available for use. So just a quick recap, as we always do, an oxygen concentrator is a medical device that is used to deliver oxygen to, pe uh, to people who have low levels of oxygen in their bloodstream. Uh, this device it works by removing nitrogen from the air and delivering concentrated oxygen to the user through a mask or a nasal cannula. So oxygen concentrators are commonly used by people with lung conditions such as COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema or pneumonia, and as well as those who have recently had surgery or are just recovering from an illness. So they are, uh, these concentrators, they are portable, relatively easy to use, and provide a safe and reliable source of oxygen for people who require supplemental oxygen therapy. This is unlike uh, oxygen cylinders that are heavy and they require refilling uh, from time to time. 
So there are two main types of oxygen concentrators. Uh, we have continuous flow oxygen concentrators and fast dose oxygen concentrators. So as I've already said, uh, in this topic of interest, we're going to look into detail about these uh, two types of oxygen concentrators. And, uh, but before we do that, uh, it's good to just take a quick look at the physiology of breathing in humans. So the physiology of breathing uh, in humans involves a complex series of events that allow for, uh, for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and the bloodstream. Uh, a brief overview of the physiology of breathing. Uh, first, we have inspiration, which is also called inhalation. This uh, occurs when the diaphragm contracts and the intercostal muscles, uh, those muscles between the ribs, they raise the rib cage. Uh, what happens after this is that the volume of the thoracic cavity is increased. So an increase in volume results in a decrease in pressure, and this creates a pressure gradient. The atmospheric pressure becomes greater than uh, the pressure in the lungs, and the air lungs uh, rushes into the lungs from the atmosphere. After this, uh, we have oxygen exchange. So the oxygen that is held uh, from the air, it diffuses across the thin walls of the alveoli into the bloodstream and binds to hemoglobin in red blood cells. And then inside uh, the cells, uh, there is carbon dioxide exchange. So this carbon dioxide is just a waste product of cellular respiration and it diffuses from the bloodstream and into the alveoli where it is expelled during ex uh, exhalation. Now, exhalation is just the last stage of the uh, breathing physiology. So this occurs when the diaphragm relaxes and the intercostal muscles also they relax. Uh, this causes the volume of the thoracic cavity to decrease and the pressure within the lines increases. So this increase in pressure pushes the air out of the lines. So the pressure in the uh, lungs comes greater than atmospheric pressure. So this process occurs continuously and automatically to maintain the body's oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. And the rate and type of breathing can be controlled cautiously, which is uh, allows for a regulation of oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. Now, uh, let's look at the breath curve. So a person's breathing pattern can be summarized in a breath curve. So a breath curve is a classical representation of a person's breathing pattern over time. So a breath curve is that thing that you see in the graphics. So this breath curve, it shows a volume of air held um, and exhaled during each breath and also the time during uh, each inhalation and exhalation. So uh, this breath curve can be used to assess a uh, person's breathing pattern. Uh, monitors changes in breathing over time and also in uh, design of oxygen concentrators that are going, uh, some types of oxygen concentrators that are going to look into. Now, since I've already said that there are two types of oxygen concentrators that are available for use, uh, so it's best to have the continuous flow oxygen concentrators and we have the pass dose oxygen concentrators. Now, let's look at the continuous flow oxygen concentrators. So continuous flow oxygen concentrators, uh, these are concentrators that deliver a continuous flow of oxygen to the user, regardless of their breathing patterns. So these uh, concentrators are commonly used by people with severe lung condition, and they require high and constant flow of oxygen. Uh, so I've explained about the breath cave and and these concentrators, they deliver oxygen to the patient for the entire duration of the breath curve. There is no uh, stopping uh, oxygen delivered to the patient until uh, the device has been disconnected from the patient. So once you just uh, you connect the device to the patient, uh, there will be continuous flow until you switch it off or disconnect it from the patient. So the majority of concentrators that we found uh, in hospitals or anywhere else, the majority of those concentrators are of this type. And since uh, we have done a lot on this type, so I will not dwell much on these types of concentrators. Because since the start of uh, this call, we have been dealing with 
posts are continuous folks and content creators. So the examples are the Devil Beast, uh, Devil Beast series are the 525, 515, the Long J5, J10, Ganta V8 and V10, Airship, and many other types of posting traders. Those are continuous posts in posting traders. Now we're going to look into uh, past doors of in posting traders. So past doors posting traders, sometimes uh, they're called past flow oxygen concentrators. So these are concentrators that uh, deliver oxygen in short places. So these places are synchronized with the user's breathing patterns. Uh, these first dose oxygen concentrators, they are more energy efficient and lighter in weight compared to continuous flow oxygen concentrators. Therefore, uh, it, makes it, uh, it makes them more suitable for people who are mobile and need a portable device because they are light in weight and they are energy efficient. So of these first dose oxygen concentrators, we have uh, the generic first dose oxygen concentrators. So this is just uh, the work by using a basic sensor, a basic pressure sensor to detect the onset of inhalation and then delivering a burst of oxygen in this pulse. So the oxygen that is delivered on the onset of inhalation is called a bolus. And this uh, bolus of oxygen is just a short concentrated burst of uh, oxygen that is delivered to the patient. So this is why uh, uh, sometimes the past dose oxygen concentrators are referred to as bolus delivery oxygen concentrators. So I've said that uh, these concentrators, the generic past dose concentrators, they work by uh, detecting the pressure at the onset of inhalation so that they can deliver the bolus to the patient. So at the end of uh, how uh, precisely they know that this is the onset of uh, inhalation is that at the end of exhalation, the pressure in the lungs is around 1.5 psi. And when the sensor detects this pressure, it will know that exhalation has ended and inhalation will follow. So the machine then will have a delay of one to two seconds, which is the automatic breathing pause of a healthy human being. And then after this automatic pause, uh, they deliver a bolus for about one to two seconds, which is the normal duration of inhalation. So using this mechanism, uh, the past dose concentrators uh, will drive oxygen during the upper portion of the breath cave. And these uh, concentrators are off or they do not deliver oxygen on the lower portion of the breath cave. So they just deliver the oxygen on the uh, uh, upper portion of the breath cave. So the best example of a first dose oxygen concentrator is the Inogen 1 G5 oxygen concentrator, the concentrator that you see in the graphics. So that is a, a very good example of a first dose concentrator. So this concentrator, the Inogen 1 G5, uh, it uses what is called Atrasis technology. So Atrasense is Atrasense technology, just a feature that is found in the Energen 1G5 or and some other past dose concentrators. So this technology, uh, this technology, uh, this technology senses a person's breath and then delivers a pass of oxygen in this pulse, thereby ensuring that the user receives the appropriate amount of oxygen during inhalation only. So this AtroSense feature, uh, it enhances the accuracy of this delivery, unlike the generic ones that just use a basic pressure sensor. So this AtroSense, it enhances the accuracy uh, by detecting subtle changes in breathing patterns and adapting the delivery accordingly. So this AtroSense technology is very beneficial for patients who require supplemental oxygen, uh, especially those with, uh, I've talked about COVD, yeah, those conditions. So this addresses uh, it improves the efficiency and comfort of oxygen therapy by delivering oxygen more precisely and consistently. And it can also help uh, extend the battery life of product oxygen concentrators. Now let's look at how we can assess and do some basic troubleshooting on past dose oxygen concentrators. 
So despite the complexities of Pastor's concentrator, uh, the troubleshooting process is almost the same as with continuous flow of concentrator. So some of the uh, basic troubleshooting that can be done on a first dose concentrator are the same with continuous flow concentrator. And this can include, if you have a first dose concentrator that is not power remote, just to check the power source, ensure that the concentrator is probably plugged in and the heart rate is functioning. That is, heart rate is uh, giving out uh, the right uh, voltage. So these first dose concentrators they also have suit as any uh, continuous flow concentrators uh, have the cabinet filters, the intake filters, gross particle filters, bacteria filters. So the um, past dose concentrators they also have these same filters and their name is also the same. So as you all know that these filters they may get, uh, they not may, but they do get dated uh, with time. So it's important that if you have a pastose concentrator, you clean those filters if they are washable. And if you see that uh, some have an intake uh, uh, filter that is non washable, for example, the HEPA filter, then you just replace it when uh, uh, the filters have become daily. So this is very good in all, across all types of concentrators, not just continuous ones, but also pastose concentrators. Uh, checking the oxygen flow also. Uh, uh, when using these concentrators, you need to make sure that the flow meter is set to the correct level and the flow of oxygen, uh, make sure that the flow of oxygen is steady. So the inside these pastose concentrators, we have tubing, just like the continuous flow of oxygen concentrators. Inside there is no slight difference. So the tubing, these tubings are also subject to leakages, just as we encounter you know, uh, when maintaining continuous flow of oxygen concentrators. So when uh, this first dose concentrator, as if you uh, say the period and see that it's not producing the required uh, period levels of oxygen, you can check for leaks. It might be six losing uh, some oxygen through leaks. So checking uh, for leaks in first dose concentrators is the same as how we do it in, uh, in continuous flow oxygen concentrators. You can check for these leaks by just using soapy water, apply soapy water especially to uh, places where tubings are joining, where there are two connectors, where there are, um, let's say, check valves. So if you see that bubbles are forming around the uh, joints when you apply so the order, you know that there are leaks there and you can fix that leak. So for those concentrators like the Inogen 1G5 that have uh, address technology, it's also uh, likely that you encounter some trouble with the trusses technology. So this is though uh, it is a complicated technology, but it's still easy to troubleshoot and uh, figure out how we can get it back to working state. So if you encounter trouble with the trusses technology, you can check the battery. You have to ensure that the battery is fully charged and properly installed. So if the battery is, for example, the manual of the Energy 95, they say that if the battery is discharged to uh, less than 25%, it's full charge, uh, the address technology is the health. So you have to make sure that the battery is charged well and properly installed. If you have, if you're using direct power from the outlet, you have to make sure that the outlet is producing the required amount of required voltages. You can also check the sensors, ultra sense technology is full of sensors, the pressure sensors and like. So you have to check those sensors to make sure that they are properly mounted on the PCB. If they are at solder points, you just need to uh, solder them back in positions just to make sure that they are not obstructed. Sometimes the uh, these uh, concentrators, they might have uh, both the continuous flow and the past dose mode. There are some concentrators that have those uh, two modes in one. So for those concentrators, there are settings embedded in it that you have to choose the correct mode that you want to work with. So it might happen that you want the past dose mode, but then the settings are set to um, continuous flow. And you might think that ah, this concentrator is not working, it's producing continuous flow of oxygen yet, 
it's a bus close concentrator. So what you have to do is check for the settings to make sure that uh, the correct mode is selected for those concentrators that have the that have both the uh, fast close mode and the continuous flow mode. So it's very important to check uh, for those settings. You can know if that concentrator has these two modes by just checking in the service manual that comes with the concentrator. There they will clearly indicate if uh, the concentrator is capable of handling the continuous flow mode and the pass dose mode. Now a pass dose oxy concentrator, uh, it has a compressor just like a continuous flow oxy concentrator. So larger uh, pass dose concentrators use uh, the same piston compressors that are used in continuous flow uh, concentrators. For example, those found in the devil piece five to five with those double orbit compressors. So the compressors, uh, compressor kits, they get uh, worn out after a long period of use, usually after 5,000 million hours, and they have to be serviced in the same way that uh, you service the concentrator, uh, continuous flow concentrator compressors. So you replace the cylinder sleeves, you replace the uh, cups, it's by replacing the caskets with a forty, just to make sure that the concentrator is functioning properly. For smaller pastos concentrators that can be carried on the back, instead of the piston concentrator uh, compressors, they use what are called Teflon compressors because they are light in weight. So the Teflon compressors have a uh, this protecting Teflon inside that uh, works like that piston, uh, piston in in uh, continuous flow concentrators. So this Teflon is usually uh, made up of rubber or Teflon or thermoplastic, and it also gets worn out with time, and it has to be replaced when it has worn out. Lastly, uh, pastos concentrators also have seal beds, which are filled with zeolite. So the World Health Organization, it, they recommend the filling seal beds after 5,000 like, million hours. So in past those concentrators, if you see the like, accumulated hours is 4,000, there's a need to refill those seal beds to make sure they continually uh, add uh, optimum, uh, optimum performance of the concentrator. So the procedure for refilling seal beds is the same as that for continuous flow. You remove the seal beds inside and uh, make sure that this is done in a room whose humidity is less than 45%. So uh, reaching this far, that is all that I had for you in today's topic of interest. Thank you for attention. Back to you now. Wow. Thank you very much, Fatani, for that well-detailed topic of interest. I hope we have all learned a lot, so much. I wish there was a poll at the end of the topic of interest that says, how many of us knew that we have continuous flow and fast dose uh, oxygen concentrators? But thank you very much once again, Patani, for that topic of interest. Um, do we have any comments or questions? Okay, we have a hand from Mwawi. Go ahead. I just wanted to create a quick poll uh, on the post dose, and then maybe we can just see how many people have ever encountered this before. So maybe as I wait for that, maybe you can also take on other questions and comments. Okay, thank you very much, Mwari, for that. So as he is creating the poll, do we have any questions or comments on what Fatani has just explained on the topic of interest? Types of oxygen considerators. Okay, seems like we have none. So Mwari, should we wait for you or we can move on to the next question so that you create the poll? Yeah, I think we can move on and then we'll jump back just after uh, we've taken one more question. Thank you very much for that. So we move on to our next question as Maui is creating the poll. And our next question reads, hello, I'm a nurse working in the male ward at a facility. I have come to notice that the nurses that work in the female ward normally wash the mesh at the back of the concentrators. When I ask them, they say that since it has accumulated dust, they need to wash it. Does this damage the mesh in the process? Does this not damage the mesh in the process? And can it still work the way it's supposed to work? So the nurse wants to know if the mesh behind the concentrator can be washed 
and if the process of washing it does not damage it. So I'll ask one of our technicians on the panel to respond to that question. Okay, we have a hand from Paulina. You go ahead. Thank you, Naomi. And thank you for the question. That is a good observation um, to the person who asked the question. And it is a good practice that your fellow nurses have taken up. The mesh that you find at the back of your concentrator is called a gross particle filter. And it comes with different shapes and sizes depending on the model of the concentrator that you have. Though sometimes not visible to our eyes, the air we breathe contains so many particles, some large and some small for the eyes to see. Oxygen concentrators work by drawing this air into the machine and filtering out the nitrogen and other constituents to have concentrated oxygen. The particles found in air, if taken into the system, will clog the concentrator parts, which can damage the machine and reduce its lifespan. Therefore, filters are used in oxygen concentrators to trap these particles and prevent them from proceeding into the system. Concentrators use different types of filters at different stages. We have the gross particle filter, the intake filter, and the bacteria filter. The gross particle filter is like the first line of defense for oxygen concentrators against particle filters found in the air. This is um, a mesh that you were referring to. It traps large particles that are found in the air. It looks like a sponge or a mesh screen, and it is usually found at the back of the concentrator housing or on the sides. The gross particle filter is washable. It can be washed with soapy water and then let it air dry before putting it back. This um, material was designed to be washable, so you do not need to worry about getting it damaged. Um, the other particle filter is an intake filter. This one is connected to the intake of the compressor. It traps dust particles that may have passed through the cross particle filter. The intake filters also work as a noise dampener to reduce the noise produced by the compressor. The intake filter differ across manufacturers, manufacturers of oxygen concentrators. Some concentrators like the ASAP and the J5 have washable intake filters. This can, these can be washed um, in the same way as the gross particle filters. So some of the J5 filter and the ASAP filter are on the screen for a reference. So for concentrators like the Givilbis and many other models, these ones use the non-washable HEPA intake filters. Um, the HEPA stands for high efficiency particular, particulate air filter. Since they are not washable, these filters should be replaced when they have become visibly dirty. Um, so on screen, there's an image of um, different kinds of HEPA filter that you will find in different kinds of different types of um, concentrator models. The Kanta concentrator have an intake filter that is also non-washable, but this one can be opened up like a bottle and uh, the dirt that is accumulated can easily be blown out of this filter. And you can replace it when you see that um, you can no longer reuse it. In most concentrators, these filters are placed at the, the HEPA filters. In most concentrators, these filters are placed um, in the filter cabinet and they can easily be accessed. Um, while for some concentrator model like an SEP, they are placed inside the concentrator. So in order to access them, you will need to open up the housing of the machine, which is a task that is best um, done by a biomedical engineer. So when the machine has run for some time, just make sure you alert them so they can come and clean these filters for you. The other filter that is used in oxygen concentrators is the bacteria filter. A bacteria filter is found inside of the machine. 
in most of the concentrators. Um, it is located between the product tank and also the inlet of the flow meter, and it looks like a check valve, but it is bigger. A bacteria filter is used to trap any bacteria that has gone through the system to protect the patient from um, getting any infections. A blocked bacteria filter does not allow air to pass, and it has to be replaced as it is not washable. Just like the, um, the HEPA filter that is in the air SEP filters, um, these filters, the bacteria filter, this one will be best accessed by the biomedical um, engineer as it is located inside of the oxygen concentrators. But in some um, concentrators like the OxyPure and the Kaia, those are easily accessed. They can easily be accessed from the outside. So you can check, you can check them yourself if you have those concentrators. Um, the filters that, is, that I have explained that are washable should be washed on a weekly basis, either once or twice a week, depending on the environment where the machine is being operated. If these um, filters are not well taken care of, they will be clogged with that, especially the gross particle filter and the intake filter. There would be a restriction of airflow if these are not well taken care of. And if there is a restriction, then the performance of the concentrator will be affected as well. Um, thank you and, all, and back to you, Naomi. Thank you very much, Paulina, for that wonderful explanation and making sure our fellow nurse understands better what the gross particle filter is. I heard you mention the first line defense. So yeah, she can take it as the first line defense of the oxygen concentrator. So thank you very much for that. Do we have any follow-up questions or comments? I saw a hand from Patani. Do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, add on what Paulina uh, said about the bacteria filter. So in most uh, manuals, uh, most manuals they state that the bacteria filter should be changed once a year. So if it gets damaged, then uh, I might need to change it before the year ends. But most uh, manuals recommend that you change the bacteria filter once a year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patani, for that comment. Do we have any further questions or comments? Okay, seems like we have none. So looking at our time, this marks the end of our call today. Just a reminder for those that are joining us for the first time, don't forget to share with us your contact details in the chat so that we add you to the emailing list. But also, our call is always hosted every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m., so be sure to join us again next week. If you have any questions regarding your oxygen considerators, you can send them up front to us through our email, info at oxygenalliance.org, and we'll try our very best to give you the possible solutions. You can also visit our website, www.oxygenalliance.org, and there you can get a look and a glimpse at the work that Oxygen Alliance does. We also have a YouTube channel, so you can visit us. There we post past calls, recordings of the past calls, and also other videos regarding oxygen concentrators. So while you're there, you can subscribe, but also don't forget to hit the notifications bell so that you can have notifications whenever it is that new material has been posted. So without wasting much of your time, goodbye from me and see you next week.